All right, thank you everyone for attending seminar this week. This is the nutrition exercise physiology seminar. This is one of our hybrid seminars. So some of us are in person here in ACOF and then right now we've got about 25 people on Zoom. So thanks everybody for attending. Um, today we're gonna to do a little bit different. So Dr. Priya is actually going to introduce our speaker this week and he is on Zoom. So give us a second while we technically move things around and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Priya. All right, good afternoon to those of you in the ACAF auditorium and to those of you connected via Zoom. Welcome to our NEP seminar series. My name is Jaume Padilla and I'm a faculty member in nutrition and exercise physiology. And today it's my privilege to introduce our speaker, Ryan Petitmi, who is a fourth year graduate student in our department, co-mentored by Dr. Jill Canali and myself. I met Ryan at the 2015 ACSM meeting, I believe in San Diego. We met in a shadow from the hotel to the conference center. I don't know if you remember this, Ryan, but you inquired about our graduate program and based on your questions on vascular insulin resistance, I already knew you were going to be a great student and I was right. Ryan has been followed by a growing cohort of Irish students all from Central Michigan, Rory, Mari, Gavin, Alan. And looking back, it's interesting to know that uh, it all started in this shadow ride. It turned out to be very productive. Prior to arriving to Mizzou, Ryan completed his bachelor's in the sports and exercise science from the University in, of Limerick in Ireland, and subsequently his master's in exercise science from Central Michigan University. While at Central Michigan, he also obtained a master's in health administration, something I did not remember. Here at Mizzou, Ryan has been kept uh, very busy working in two different laboratories. In Dr. Canali's lab, Ryan has been highly involved in overnight studies examining the effects of exercise on glucose control. And in my lab, Ryan has been also instrumental in assisting with insulin clamps and also in in vivo and ex vivo human uh, and animal vascular studies. As a result of all his contributions, Ryan is co-author of uh, eight publications in addition, he has one other paper currently under review as a first author. Ryan is currently driving his dissertation project, which is aimed at to examine the therapeutic effects of passive heating on vascular function in patients with type 2 diabetes. And notably, Ryan is one of the very few graduate students who in his dissertation project has been able to couple human clinical research with basic science, including endothelial cell culture experiments, thus making his work highly translational. Today, Ryan will present a study that he did over the last two years related to fidgeting and glucose control in humans. Ryan, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, can you guys all see me on the screens in Zoom? Yep, very good, okay. So, move that up right there, okay. So the title of this presentation is Leg Fidgeting During Prolonged Sitting Improves Postprandial Glycemic Control in People with Type 2, or in People with Obesity. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background on three main core areas. So obesity, obesity is associated with insulin resistance and also incurring postprandial hyperglycemia which itself is an independent predictor of cardiovascular disease and mortality based on multiple uh, clinical studies. And so this is a very, very important target for assessing therapeutic effects in order to reduce postprandial hyperglycemia. Obesity itself also causes a kind of blunting in skeletal muscle blood flow in response to postprandial feeding. And at the same time, also blunts 
insulin-dependent glucose uptake, both contributing to this postprandial hypoglycemia. Prolonged sitting has also been shown to have decreased metabolic demand, decreased blood flow to the lower legs, which we'll talk about over the next few slides. And in combination, there are multiple studies showing that prolonged sitting, because of some of those factors, especially the decreased metabolic demand, can contribute to this postprandial hyperglycemia. So this was a study done by Dunstan and this group in particular, he is actually gonna be speaking in a couple of weeks time. So it's gonna be really, really nice seeing his presentation. But overall, what they've been looking at is kind of this growing epidemic of, of, of sitting time and showing how glycemic control can be impacted by it. So what they've been showing is that prolonged sitting exacerbates postprandial glucose and that physical activity breaks, lowers it. So if you look into the graph over on the left-hand side, this is plasma glucose concentration curves. And as we can see in the squares over here is uninterrupted sitting. And what they did was they had about 19 participants who, um, who had overweight or obesity. And what they did, they sat them over this course of five hours and every 20 minutes for the light intensity activity breaks, people would get up and walk for about two minutes at about two miles per hour and then sit back down. So they did about 14 bouts over this five hour period, about three bouts per hour. With the moderate intensity, they increased that to about anywhere from 3.5 to four miles an hour. And as we can see over here, in the graph over here, when you look at the uh, area under the curve, you see that indeed physical activity breaks did lower postprandial glucose. And this dagger over here shows that compared to uninterrupted sitting, there was a significant effect and that this effect was even more significant with moderate intensity activity breaks. They also looked at plasma insulin concentrations and found exactly the same thing. So a meta-analysis was done by Dempsey back in 2016 in which they were looking at different types of activity breaks versus sitting. So over here on the x-axis, SRA is um, simple resistance exercises or activity. Again, moderate intensity, physical activity, light intensity, and just standing. This line over here represents uh, mean postprandial uh, plasma glucose AUC, and then anything that shifted to the left was a decreased change in that postprandial plasma glucose AUC percent. And what you can see over here in the key is that anything in red was studies done with patients with type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. Anything in orange is overweight to obese. And then blue is in healthy, normal weight. So the, the take-home message of this is that you do need movement in order to facilitate decreases in postprandial plasma glucose. We have varying ranges when you look at differences in standing compared to light intensity versus moderate intensity and so forth. And again, like I said, movement is key. More specifically, skeletal muscle contraction is crucial. This increases metabolic demand and it promotes insulin independent glucose uptake, such as with facilitating AMPK signaling, GLUT4 translocation. And the key part of this is that it's not fully compromised by obesity. This represents why exercise is a cornerstone treatment therapy for lowering postprandial glucose in patients with insulin resistance and or type two diabetes. And again, movement also facilitates the increase in substrate delivery by increased blood flow to the working muscle. Now, even with people being aware of all these health benefits of getting up, breaking up, sitting, and, and, and so forth over the workday, there were a couple of studies done recently this year that there was a group in Scotland and a group in Australia, and they actually kind of did some qualitative research in in people that were working at their desk for most of the day. And despite the known benefits, these were common occurrences or themes to be barriers that precluded reducing sitting time with activity breaks, even though they knew it was good for them. Things such as pressures to be constantly working, workplace cultures, they wouldn't get support from their employer or there was external judgment from other employees. Workplace behavior norms, some people would say that they feel that if they were getting up and moving around, it would be distracting to others and just frowned upon that it wasn't just normal behavior. They thought or perceived there would be reductions in work productivity, loss in spe and having specific work tasks such as deadlines, meetings, clients, that they weren't able to get up and leave their desk. And more importantly, some felt that they didn't have a knowledge that this was or how to actually get the best benefit and no confidence in performing said activities. But what if there was an alternative? What if you could do something while still sat down 
to kind of mitigate some of these barriers in order to facilitate maybe some possible changes in postprandial glycemic responses. So sitting is associated with more, low metabolic demand during prolonged sitting. And this was actually done by uh, James Levin over at the, uh, at the Mayo Clinic. And over here in red, in the black bar, we have energy expenditure. And over here is heart rate and the white bars over here. But they did a comparison where they had about 16 normal healthy individuals and they looked at different possible strategies and how those would affect energy expenditure when people were sitting for long periods of time. This foot fidget thing was a device where you basically put your foot on it and it just bounces up and down. And then they had this core chair, which was for like stability. And then they had exercise videos or just walking simply at two miles an hour. But what we can see from this foot fidget is at least that leg fidgeting does increase energy expenditure above that of just sitting. Furthermore, like I said before, prolonged sitting decreases leg blood flow, likely due to the bends in the leg itself. So over here on the left was a study done by our group in which what we measured was resting mean blood flow through the popliteal artery, which is the one that runs right behind your knee. And what we can see is just within two hours of sitting, a somewhat 70% reduction in popliteal artery blood flow. So tying that in together with some of the previous slides is that we could also be facilitating a decrease in substrate delivery to muscle in order to invoke insulin-dependent glucose uptake itself. Again, that needs further investigation. Over here on the right, to kind of tease out some of the mechanisms, a past student of ours, uh, Lauren Walsh, now Lauren Park, actually had to lie down on a bed. And what she did was with a leg, compare a, a bent leg. And what she saw was if you compare the two legs here with a bent leg, you get significant reductions in blood flow going through that popliteal artery. If you look at the body positioning up in this picture up here, that represent what is actually happening with you guys sat down right now. So when your popliteal arteries give it a little bit of time, that blood flow through that popliteal artery there is going to likely decrease. But we found that leg fidgeting does maintain leg blood flow during prolonged sitting. So this simple action here where you keep both your feet on the ground, you raise your heel and you put it back down again. This protocol was done by um, a postdoc student between Dr. Padilla and Dr. Canali's lab. And what he found was that if you compare both a control leg that stays sedentary versus a fidgeting leg, that blood flow was maintained during that popliteal artery that was fidgeting over the course of three hours of prolonged sitting here on the left hand side here. Over here, because it's actually very difficult to measure blood flow directly while someone is fidgeting, what he ended up doing was actually recording the blood flow or more so here popliteal artery shear rate, which is synonymous with increased blood or with blood flow that if you have increased shear rate, you have increased blood velocity and you have increased blood flow. But what he measured was that as soon as you stop fidgeting, you have this abundant increase in blood flow going through the popliteal artery that will transiently decrease within about 30 to 40 seconds or so. So what we're seeing is that the act of fidgeting itself is a, is a um, stimulus to invoke huge increases in popliteal artery blood flow. So kind of putting this all together, that if fidgeting itself can increase energy expenditure or more so the muscle contractions of the fidgeting can increase energy expenditure and skeletal muscle um, metabolic demand. And also at the same time, the blood flow feeding into that moving muscle could that have an impact on improving postprandial glycemic control in people? So that led to the research question, can leg fidgeting during sitting improve postprandial glycemic control, especially in people with obesity, since we know that the, the signaling mechanisms and that associate with skeletal muscle contractions is not fully inhibited, or basically insulin independent glucose uptake is not inhibited by obesity itself. So, what we did. We recruited um, part, uh, people within the Columbia area, uh, mainly looking for um, overweight to obese individuals. And when they were recruited, what they would do is they would come in after an overnight fast about 10 to 12 hours, and we would position them into a standard office chair. When they were sat down, we then marked where their foot placement was on the floor, and we also marked where the chair was because they were going to be coming in for a randomized crossover design. When they had been sat 
for about 15 minutes to acclimate, what we would then do is that we had them uh, an IV blood draw at the beginning and then about 20 minutes after. But while they were sat down for the first 20 minutes, we actually fit them with a uh, face mask that measured oxygen consumption or energy expenditure, if you will, over that course of just plain resting via indirect calorimetry. During that time, we also took one of those legs and used an ultrasound to continuously record uh, popliteal artery diameter and blood velocity signals that if you put into a mathematical equation will turn into arterial blood flow, okay? After about that 20 minutes acclimation period or the oxygen consumption, we then gave them a standard 75 gram glucose beverage, which they then drank. And then over three hours, they were sacked. During those three hours, they were either randomized to do condition A or condition B first, and then they would switch about seven days after. However, we did have a few uh, premenopausal women, so we measured all of these metabolic and vascular function measurements within the early uh, follicular phase, so we usually about the uh, one to seven days of the menstrual cycle, and then we waited about 28 days for their next cycle to begin, just to keep things consistent. So what they would do is they would either not fidget, or they would do intermittent cyclical bouts of bilateral leg fidgeting, so they move both legs in that same um, picture that I showed you before where they lightly raised their heel up and they tapped it back down again. And they did this for two and a half minutes on and then they rested and then two minutes on, rested, two minutes on and rested. So they actually did accumulate about 90 minutes of fidgeting during the three hour course. Every 15 minutes or so, they were fit with the face mask again and recorded oxygen consumption for another five or 15 minutes. And that was pre every half hour for the three hours on each 30 minute mark. And at the same time, we then took ultrasound recordings for blood flow, and we also sampled with the IV. Does that all make sense? Okay. So our inclusion and exclusion criteria were both women and men, about 20 to 6 years of age, and a body mass or BMI of greater than 25, no known act active cancer or cardiovascular, pulmonary, kidney, or liver disease, and no diagnosed diabetes mellitus, and not using any tobacco product use. This was our par participant demographics, and I know there's a lot, so I'll talk you through it. So over here on the left-hand side in the top, most of our participants were around the 42 um, years of age, and we predominantly had females. So we had 15 females with five males, so we had 20 participants full. And then as we come down here to BMI, again, we did hit o or the range of obesity, what about 37.5, and then Previous to coming in for their experimental visits, they, when they came in for a consenting session, we did do just some preliminary screening. So we took a finger stick and we measured that for lipids using a lipid panel, using a Cholestec device. And we recorded blood pressure as well. So again, they were hypertensive, but the rest of the time, usually their glucose and their triglycerides with millimoles per liter within somewhat normal healthy ranges. However, when we actually combined the criteria for metabolic syndrome, we found that about 12 participants did classify as having metabolic syndrome. However, the main thing that we got a lot of people on was obviously waist circumference, blood pressure, but we did not have anyone with a fasting blood glucose over 100. Some participants were taking prescription medications. When they came in for their testing sessions, we did not stop them taking any prescription medications. However, we didn't have anyone taking glucose regulating, regulating medications. And what we see over here is that we had about three on ACE inhibitors, one on a diuretic, one on estrogen modulators, two that had IUDs, and four that had oral contraceptives, and one that had synthetic thyroid hormone. And the two that, that did have an IUD did still have regular menses. So again, they followed the same pattern of the first seven days of the folliculus uh, phase, and then came back again 28 days later. Okay, so our results was, we then also stuck an accelerometer on the top of the right thigh, just above the kneecap. The reason that we did that was just kind of validate were they moving around or not. And so what we see over here is within this graph, these accelerometers are just arbitrary units. So when you place an accelerometer, it measures movement across three different axes. What we ended up doing was using a thing called vector magnitude, 
which then takes all of those three axes into consideration and kind of averages all of those responses around. So this does not equate to like steps or anything like that. This is basically just taking a pedometer and shaking it around. So what we see is on the left-hand side of this, of this x-axis is no fidget. And then we had people that did fidget. And what we do see is that leg fidgeting did increase accelerometer counts by design of the study. What we also found was that leg fidgeting increased oxygen consumption. So over in the uh, clear circles, we have no fidget condition. And then in the black circles, we have the fidgeting condition. So we can see that fidgeting did increase oxygen consumption from baseline. And that, was con and that stayed above baseline throughout the, uh, throughout the three hours of sitting. And again, at each time point, we found significant differences between the no fidget and fidgeting condition in response to oxygen consumption. Fidgeting had a main effect, time and effect, and we also had an interaction. And again, we also found that leg fidgeting increased leg blood flow, and there's a lot going on this slide, so I will talk you through this as well. So this is looking at blood flow milliliters per minute. In this line over here, what you have is on the x-axis, the time point at which we actually collected the blood flow, and that was two minutes after that 30 minutes. So that is the full two minutes of data collection occurring right there. So over here at, at zero is baseline. And what you see is there was no real difference between the no fidget and fidgeting condition. But as we move through the different time points, 30, 60, all the way to three hours, we see significant increases or differences between blood flow in the fidgeting and no fidgeting condition. When we actually kind of superimposed each of those curves on one another, we were wondering if whether the later time points had increased blood flow, was there like an accumulation to the multiple balance? Was some kind of like vasodilatory response occurring? And so what we decided to do then was then calculate the area underneath each of the, or the area under the curve at each of those responses. And again, we see that there again, there is a lot going on here, but again, no fidget in the blank circles and then the fidget in the dark circles, zero time point, no difference between the condition, 30, not so much either, but then when we get to 60 and 90, we do. And what we see is within these asterisks, there is a difference between the no fidget and the fidget condition. And then with these crosses is that there is a difference between within the fidget condition, the time point against the baseline time point. So again, what we've shown so far is that fidgeting has increased both accelerometer counts, oxygen consumption, and increased leg blood flow through the popliteal artery. So when we then look at the glucose responses and the insulin responses, what we did with the blood samples was when they came at the EDTA, we measured glucose on the YSI machine, which is used as a glucose oxidase reaction. And then we spun the samples down so that we collected the plasma and we ran insulin responses on um, ELISA kits that were from uh, Alpco. And what we see in this graph here is glucose is on the left-hand side, and then the time point is across the x-axis here again. Pretty much the same symbols throughout this presentation are that no fidget are within opal circles and fidget are within black circles. And what we kind of see is that there is a similar curve response between the two conditions that we did see a fidget main effect. We also saw a time effect, but there was no interaction. When we did compare certain time points against each other just to see if there was anything likely to be happening, we found more difference within this early phase of the peak within the first hour than we did at any other time point. And again, Asterix is showing that there is a difference between the no fidget and the fidget condition. And these cross marks are for two-way repeated measures and over. So when we actually looked at area under the curve, we found that there was a significant reduction in postprandial glucose AUC responses over here in this left graph. So we see no fidget against fidget that the postprandial glucose AUC was reduced by fidgeting over the three hours of sitting, and we saw a Cohen's D or large effect size of 0.86. This graph over here on the right-hand side is showing you the absolute change in glucose AUC per individual. And how it's labeled is, is that the greatest reduction or the person that had the greatest reduction is starting here on the far left-hand side of this graph and crossing over to the, did someone have the greatest increase over here on the far right. So what we see is that we had a majority of participants respond positively to the fidgeting 
that showed a reduction in postprandial glucose area on the curve. When we then look at their insulin responses, we see the same kind of similar response in terms of postprandial insulin uh, curve. Again, not really much difference between the two specifically. And we did run just a quick comparison and found that the later time point there was a significant effect. But when you look at the area under the curve, we kind of get a similar response to that as the glucose response. Again, over here on the left hand side, we have insulin AUC. Between the no fidget and the fidgeting condition, we have a slight reduction where there was a moderate effect size. Again, when we plot the absolute change in insulin AUC per individual in the right graph over here, starting with the greatest reduction to the greatest increase, we see that a, a good portion of participants did respond again positively, but we had less of an effect size than we did on uh, insulin AUC than we did with glucose AUC. And when we took some of these, um, these particular time pointed um, blood collections, what we did was we did run a Matsuda insulin sensitivity index. So the calculation is over here, which Matsuda is kind of a, a, an estimate of whole body insulin sensitivity. So if you can increase Matsuda, it's showing that you're becoming more insulin sensitive. And so what we're doing over here is 10,000 divided by the square root of the fasting plasma glucose by the fasting plasma insulin by the mean uh, glucose concentration over the oral glucose tolerance test or the glucose beverage that we gave them at certain time points. And I believe those are 30, 60, 90, and 120. So it's the mean out of those. So it does not take into consideration past 120. But what we did see was a slight improvement in Matsuda showing that in response to fidgeting, people were becoming a little bit more insulin sensitive. So we did run some correlations to see if there was anything happening between our other variables that might help to explain what it was about the fidgeting in, uh, in per se that might help with the improvements in postprandial glucose AUC. So we took like accelerometer counts and correlate the change in accelerometer counts against the change in glucose AUC responses. And we showed no correlation. Same thing with oxygen consumption. What we did kind of find though was that if you correlated the change in glucose AUC within that first hour against the change in blood flow AUC response over the first hour, that the, there was this somewhat strong relationship going on here. So again, as glucose changed or decreased, the more decrease in glucose, the higher the change in blood flow occurred, or the higher blood flow occurred, the greater change in glucose AUC. So in a summary of our main findings, by design, leg fidgeting increased oxygen consumption and leg blood flow. Leg fidgeting lowered postprandial glucose and insulin AUC responses in people with obesity. So to conclude, leg fidgeting during prolonged sitting can be a simple strategy to improve postprandial glycemic control in people at high risk of cardiometabolic disease. And that leg fidgeting likely lowered postprandial glucose due to repeated skeletal muscle contraction and the resulting increase in skeletal muscle blood flow, both contributing to glucose disposal. The take home message of this whole entire presentation is that you wanna keep moving even while you're seated. So again, with any human study that goes on, we have both our limitations and we have our strengths. So some key limitations are highlighted in the black and some strength in response to those limitations are highlighted over in the white portion. So again, we were unable to recruit equal numbers of both men and women. However, we were not assessing sex differences for the purpose of the study. The sample size of 20 participants with people with obesity adds to the limited number of studies that you saw from that meta-analysis that was conducted by Dempsey. We didn't necessarily have food intake the night before explicitly controlled for, as in we didn't give them a standardized meal based on body composition or anything like that. However, we did provide them a food diary for 24 hours before the first visit and had them receive a copy in order to replicate their food intake 24 hours before their second experimental visit. This led to a decent dietary habit maintenance and subsequently we found in those graphs that fasting glucose and fasting insulin levels were similar between conditions. And with that, I would very much like to thank all of our participants that took part in this study. And a big thank you to both of my principal investigators and mentors, Dr. Jill Canali and Dr. Jamai Padilla, whose guidance so far has been 
uh, has been wonderful. And so some key Canali and Padilla lab members, such as Sean Reddy, Lauren Park, Ying Lu, and Rebecca Schaefer, especially. Um, thank you guys. And just to disclose that though, we had nothing to disclose in, in relation to this study. And with that, I will take questions. No, we did not. That is a good question and something that we should probably uh, look into, especially that there have been some studies that show that different phases or, or estrogen levels may contribute to being vasodilatory and stuff like that. So it is definitely something to consider. Um, on the other hand, there have also been studies that don't show an effect on on different estrogen levels also. So again, we do have the plasma samples that if we wanted to have a look at, we could definitely do that. Go ahead, Brian. So we didn't directly measure like exactly how much fidgeting was going on per se, but based off of Takuma's study, a kind of natural cadence tended to be about 250 fidgets per minute, let's put it that way. Um, again, the fidgeting can vary from person to person. So what we try to do is standardize where I would actually watch them the entire time and just make sure that their heel was making contact with the floor. So for example, if you were to fidget yourself, we like to be in a kind of a position where we save as much energy as possible. So if you're fidgeting, I want to make sure that your heel is making contact with the ground. You might still be in this like kind of like your heel is slightly above. So you get into more of the spring action. So we're not getting a kind of full contraction of the muscle per se. But great question. Ryan, I have a question if I may. Yeah. So there was looking at the data, the, the distribution of the responses, there was two or three, I think three subjects that had an increase in, um, in glucose AUC in uh -huh. fidgeting. And there was also three or four subjects that had an increase in insulin AUC. Did you check if those were the same subjects or were they different? Uh, those were different actually. Okay. Those, those particular subjects were different. And kind of just to add on to your point on, was there anything special really about these particular subjects versus the others? there really wasn't any within the age range that we had, they were kind of all over the place. It was like one that was a little bit older, one that was like middle age and one that was a little bit younger from the cohort. Um, body fat distribution or body fat and BMI weren't really that different between, between those particular subjects and two were female, one was male. So again, with the low number, I couldn't tell you exactly whether there was anything specific about those particular participants. But again, what was, a strength of this study especially was that randomizing both the fidgeting and the sedentary control, putting those two together was that we were mitigating at least some kind of like order effect going on. So to have a majority of participants respond to the fidgeting when there wasn't the likelihood of an order effect going on kind of adds to the strength of the study also. Yeah, thank you. Sure. So you didn't, they were all high resistance to sleep hypertensive, but mm -hmm. you didn't show the blood pressure effect. Did fidgeting increase the blood pressure? No, we, we didn't measure blood pressure while they were doing the fidgeting. How about after? No. Okay. Mm. That, was, that was more of a screening tool. <laughs> and then to Dr. Dee's point, um, you know, you can have a So that is something that we didn't do. We didn't see if there was any differences between those with, um, without metabolic syndrome. So that is definitely a good follow-up for us, for us to do. Um, in terms of the certain criteria for them to actually be classified as metabolic syndrome, again, most of them tended to be within kind of like the waist circumference and the blood pressure. Again, there, there wasn't anyone that hit metabolic syndrome or had a criteria of increased fasting glucose to have metabolic syndrome. So they kind of somewhat similar. And again, if they were on like a cholesterol medication or their lipids were elevated again, that would add to, to it. 
Triglycerides, though, wasn't really the one that caught people out. It was HDL cholesterol. It tended to catch a lot of people out and put them within that metabolic syndrome criteria. Ryan? Mm -hmm. Camila here. Thank you. Great presentation. Did you say that the area under the curve for insulin did or did not correlate with blood flow? Did not. Did not correlate with blood flow. Okay. And can I ask you a question in your table of uh, baseline characteristics when you mention estrogen modulator, I think, sure. what, what do you mean? Um, that they were taking as a, a hormone replacement. Ah, okay, so someone taking uh, hormone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, um, Can you repeat the question, Ryan? Yes. Yeah, so the question was, was there an average between the, con between the people or between the conditions? So was there a difference in resting, I'm assuming resting energy expenditure or oxygen consumption between people? Um, not, not very much. Um, again, they seemed pretty consistent with each other. And Again, this is an absolute measurement of milliliters per minute. When we actually report it as milliliters per kg per minute, the graph is exactly the same. So most people were actually around the 3.1 mark and increased to about 3.5, 3.6. So it was just a small increase. And what the oxygen consumption increased by within the fidgeting versus not overall was about 19% difference, which actually goes back to what... Um, uh, James Levin did was they found a similar increase was that with their foot fidget and everything they like for for energy expenditure they increased about the same amount in terms of percentage so they increased I think it was something like 17 percent so we were pr pretty close one more question Ryan yeah so the effect of fidgeting on on glucose control it's statistically significant but it's it's not a dramatic effect mm -hmm. would you argue that while it's uh, it's statistically significant would would you argue that it's still clinically relevant given that this is uh, most likely if it's if this is to be repeated on a, on a daily basis this behavior that, that is a great basis, question would you argue this is clinically relevant or not so again we had people that were fidgeting and it, it it was over 90 minutes and the protocol that we used was bilateral fidgeting and it was for two and a half minutes on two and a half minutes off again consistently so realistically i don't think it's really a viable strategy that is going to you know it's not going to lead to reductions in body weight or anything like that that would be clinically relevant at least if people are able to get up and move around i would highly suggest that over the fidgeting but if you can't leave your desk then be doing something at least um, any little decrease, any little bit helps, right? So in terms of realistically, is fidgeting going to cure, you know, high postprandial hypoglycemia, it would probably be beneficial to evaluate it either against other modalities such as getting up and walking around or in combination with things such as walking around or doing simple resistance exercises or activities while you're actually sat down too. So another thing you have to take into consideration is about like the, the amount of muscle mass that you're moving, the amount of body weight that you're moving, the intensity of the muscle contraction itself. And kind of two things that we've talked about in the past as well is kind of looking at if the fidgeting increases like muscle perfusion and at the same time, could you put an EMG on someone and see if the differences in intensity of the muscle contraction have any correlation to differences in glycemic control as well. So overall, I would say, is it clinically relevant? Not by a modality all in itself, but at least to bridge you to get to not staying still at your desk, yes. Sounds good, thank you. Ryan, Camila, again, another question just following up. How do you think that that oral glucose tolerance test correlates with a real meal? Uh, because maybe there is something that might give you more or less clinical, hopefully more clinical relevance if right. there is a different response to a meal. Mm 
So that's a great suggestion because Dunstan's work over here was related to a mixed meal tolerance test rather than straight up OGTT. So to assess, fit, or assess uh, glycemic control in response to a mixed meal tolerance test and use fidgeting as the therapeutic strategy, I would definitely think it would be beneficial because there's also suggestions showing that physical activity breaks have an effect on reducing um, uh, lip, postprandial lipid levels too. So wherever fidgeting has the same effect, I'm not sure. And that would also make that a lot strong clinically. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Ryan. Great job. Hey, Ryan. Oh, two seconds, Dusty. So the question was, what were the participants doing during their time period while they were fidgeting? So we allowed them to either, you know, mainly do desk work to kind of just replicate what, again, what we were seeing in some of like the barriers to participating in physical activity. So usually I would have people either reading journals or writing up work or actually do it working remotely pre-COVID. <laughs> um, and so we didn't want, want them like doing, watching anything or anything like that, because again, maybe different film types or something that a stimulus might affect also breathing rate. So if they were watching like, for example, a horror that their, their breathing rate might be different. Whereas maybe just doing some light work would be consistent throughout everyone too. Yeah. So follow up to that, were you like measuring like there are? No. So the question was, were we also measuring like other sporadic fidgeting of other limbs? And the answer to that was no. I would have to stick accelerometers everywhere on people. And unfortunately, I did not do that. Uh, go ahead, Dusty. Um, I know you mentioned a couple of questions ago that you weren't sure how this compared to maybe like getting up and walking around every so often. Um, but do you know, or how would you predict that this would compare to say the popular sitting on a yoga ball um, at your desk? That's a great question. And the only reference I have for that was the study done by James Levin, which again was looking at energy expenditure. And based off of some of the other work that's been done where it's, you know, is, is more physical activity better than less compared to like a, you know, standing or something like that, I would hypothesize that fidgeting would likely be better than just standing by itself, but I don't know that for sure. But to compare fidgeting with say walking around um, I think that walking around would likely lead to greater glucose AUC difference responses because you are moving more body mass and you are moving more skeletal muscle or contracting more skeletal muscle. So do you think it's more about like the repeated contraction versus like kind of the isometric, you know, whenever you just have to keep a, keep your balance on the, on the yoga ball? Yes, I would, I would, I would definitely lean more towards that. It's the repeated muscle contractions. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Nice job.